Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Mythological. I am your host, co-host, I don't know how it works when there's only two hosts. I am your vice co-host, Charles, and I'm here today with Andrew, son of a crofter, Crofty Crofts. Yes, the other host. All right, hello everybody, welcome to Mythological, the show where two northern, I think the word, what's a nice PC word, gits, discuss mythology from a place of complete ignorance. So, today's episode, before we can begin it, we have a few uh, announcements kind of to make. Not, not really announcements, more clarifications, I'd say. Which is, in the last episode, I think we inadvertently said something a bit contentious, didn't we, Crofty? Yeah, we were a bit harsh on a certain historian. Yes, I had quite a few comments when I looked through, were pushing back against a couple of throwaway comments we made about Herodotus, which were basically that as flimsy as some of the tales that Herodotus included in his histories, compared with the subject of our last episode, which was Geoffrey of Monmouth, yeah, Herodotus is no Geoffrey of Monmouth, let's, let's just say. That's being very uncharitable to say that they were the same in terms of how they structured their history. So Herodotus would often put in things that he was told, but he would openly say, I am dubious of this, or I'm, this is what I was told. Geoffrey of Monmouth just made his stuff up. I think, I think that's the best way we can put it, Crofty. Geoffrey of Monmouth basically took a few elements that were already banded around within his time and just made his own story out of it. He didn't do any of the historical work that he claimed to have included in his work. Do you think that would be fair to say? Yeah, yeah. And I think perhaps my phrasing of my views on Herodotus is, I guess, all well and good to be able to say from a 21st century person's perspective, oh yeah, this is all unfounded nonsense. But on the other hand, he was, you know, 2000 years ago, didn't exactly have much by way of resources compared to what we would have now. And so he did the best he could with the time and resources available. So yeah, it did come off a bit uh, unfair on him. Well, I think it was also the case, you know, we have to remember that in a lot of older narratives around history, kind of small supernatural elements were considered, they weren't considered in a more modern secular view. They were considered very much as, you know, active and ongoing within their world at the time. So it, it makes sense that some of that gets in there as a result. Yeah. Which is actually quite a, a good linking device, I think, for our subject today, because again, we're talking about a period of history in which folklore and legends were uh, a day, part of day to day life in many parts of the world. So, Crofty, you picked the topic for today. Would you like to tell everybody what the topic is? Yes, the topic that I selected was Baba Yaga, who is often described as the wicked witch of Russian folklore. However, what we're going to discover is that she's a bit more complex than that description would have you believe. Yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure what your motivation for picking this subject was, Crofty. I, I kind of went in with this naive idea of, ooh, it's a single character, which means, ooh, there'll probably not be as big a corpus of material around them, and we can probably have a nice brief episode, and there'll be a core story that we can retell. And we couldn't, like, my, my thoughts on that matter could not have been further from the truth. Yeah, my my reasoning there was very much that this is quite a bit out of both of our comfort zones. I, for one, grew up on Egyptian and Greek and Roman mythology, and then more recently have been discovering a lot of you know Japanese and Asian mythology. Um, I know, Charles, you also grew up with sort of the Greek and Roman side of things and know a lot more about British folklore than I do. So it did seem like a good topic where it would really sort of challenge us a bit. So look into something completely or almost completely new to us. I think it's also kind of a unique challenge for us to take a very different culture's perspective on a particular figure of folklore and have to try and translate it um, and try and properly understand uh, the role that this character plays within the stories they feature in. Hmm. Yeah. Which I think with someone like King Arthur or Dragons, that's something very easy to translate to our Western sensibilities. And here I think it's a little bit more of an ambiguous figure we're working with, which is, I mean, I don't know about you, but this was a very fun episode for me personally to research because it was a fresh topic. I didn't know anything about it, really. I'd read a grand total of one story in the past to do with Baba Yaga, 
and it was just really nice to be continually surprised by the elements of the stories. Yeah, it was the same for me. I'd not even read a single story prior to this. I'd read a bit of the background and so knew of you know, some of the stranger concepts like the pot with the chicken legs and things like that. But that was basically came from me coming across the name on watching a TV show and wondering what's that and looking into it, but not really having chance until now to actually go deeper into it. Yeah, I think um, if we're talking about what our own background to this really was, my knowledge of Baba Yaga was very much just like a pop culture secondhand knowledge. So I kind of knew from playing like various tabletop role playing games in which she's used as a as like a villain or a recurring monster type. I knew of her existence from that. And I also, I think quite a few years ago now, I actually went back and tried to find some of the original stories to do with Baba Yaga, but I kind of went in with the wrong idea. I kind of thought that Baba Yaga was a figure who was in like one major story rather than having a wide corpus of literature that uh, involved her. So I went back and I found a collection of Russian folk tales by an author that we will come to in due course. But in the book, there was only one that was actually had Baba Yaga's name in the title. So, of course, that was the only one I read. And I think I will talk about that story uh, quite soon when we get to the relevant point. But, yeah, that was kind of my background. I knew of one story, and that story had some of the major features associated with Baba Yaga, but not really all of them. Yeah, whereas my pretty much my entire knowledge of her at this point, I'd first heard the name. There was a TV show about eight years or so ago called Lost Girl, which was it was sort of your standard urban fantasy set up where they tried to cram as many different mythological creatures into the same show, into a modern city as they could. So you had like the Irish fairy queens, like the Morrigan showing up. You had sirens from Greek mythology. You had succubi. You had Valkyries. Later on, you did actually have Zeus and um, Hera showing up. You had Native American skinwalkers. You know, all kinds of different mythologies just thrown into one. Yeah, kind of almost sounds like um, like a precursor to the series Fables, the more modern comic book, which tends to do tries to do something very similar and blend together all of kind of Western folklore and mythology in one single universe. Yeah, it's kind of like that. I'm not sure which came first, but yeah, in one quite early episode of this, the token human character who was Canadian of. Eastern European descent, thought she had seen Baba Yaga and panicked. And so there's all these, you know, sirens and skinwalks and such like just telling her, no, no, Baba Yaga's just a fairy tale. And <laughs> these are people who literally were referring to themselves as the Fey clans. And they dismissed Baba Yaga as a simple fairy tale. And that is what most popular culture where does with Baba Yaga. They just have the name and show to show that someone who knows that name is Eastern European but then don't really go into the actual complexities of it like they do with, say, the Irish fairy queens, the Greek gods, and such like. Like When I was researching this, I found that in the John Wick films, Russian characters refer to John Wick as Baba Yaga. I've not seen the films, but apparently they do. Yeah, I think that that's where a lot of people will probably know her from. I like the name from at least anyway, because I, I that's actually one of the few offhand things I knew about John Wick. I think I've seen the first half of the first film, but anyway. And so I think from all that we can conclude that modern Western popular culture at least isn't really doing her justice. And so hopefully people can learn a bit from this episode. Yeah. I think um the kind of complexities associated with Baba Yaga are uh, from a Western perspective, when you start looking at the topic, they're kind of staggering just how complex she is as a character and the various attributes that are placed on her. So the kind of two sources I'm used whilst collating information for this episode were I use like a more general book of collection of the Baba Yaga stories. So the one that I used was, if I bring it up here, Baba Yaga, the Wild Witch of the East in Russian Fairy Tales which is a translated collection put together by uh, is it Sibelan Forrester. Yeah. I think we had some disagreement as to how that name is pronounced. Yeah. Um, Go Google tells me Sibelan. If you haven't noticed, by the way, guys, we're trying to record this over audio uh, over Discord once again, simply because, you know, we managed to get in one episode where we were together in person. But 
Unfortunately, you know, our Welsh pronunciation last time was just so bad that as penance, Crofty has been banished to Wales. Yeah. So we're going over dodgy, like dodgy regional British internet at the moment. Hopefully we can sort all that out in post, though. Yeah, hopefully we can string something together. Anyway, sorry, what I was saying. So my that was my main source of the fairy tales that I or folk tales that I used. In addition to this, I also used a academic treatise, or at least the introduction to that academic treatise, uh, by an academic and folklorist by the name of Andreas Johns, who wrote Baba Yaga, The Ambiguous Mother and Witch of the Russian Folk Tale. So this book attempted to review the main body of Baba Yaga literature, and in the course of its compilation, According to Andreas Johns, they came across 400 texts alone, like just on including Baba Yaga alone. And he took pains to say, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many collections of Russian and Eastern Slavic folklore that he was not able to access. So I think we can say that voluminous, uh, voluminous is, I can't say that word, <laughs> voluminous, uh, is a word that would be associated with the amount of literature that has been written on Baba Yaga. Voluminous. Oh, that's the one. Right. Okay. That, well, that's, that's, that's my English lesson for the day. English speakers take a drink for his mispronunciation. Yeah. So, obviously, we can't really give a detailed overview of 400 texts. It's just not going to happen. So, what I think we settled on for this particular episode was that instead we're going to, to give an overview of the general characteristics of Baba Yaga, some ideas as to where she may have originated from and some of the background behind her name. And after that, I think we're going to kind of have a bit of a grab bag of our favourite Baba Yaga tales. Yeah, the ones I've chosen, I've tried to sort of cover as many different aspects of Baba Yaga and covering some of the more common themes and tropes in them. So we've got hopefully got quite a variety amongst them there yeah what kind of helps us out is that not only is there a big range of different traits associated with baba yaga there are several i would almost call tail types where uh that tend to follow a very similar pattern and have maybe a few minor changes here and there when i was reading through the collection of stories i had it wasn't that infrequent to come across oh here's the same story and setup with a slightly different twist on it so that is a common kind of shared part of Baba Yaga stories uh, is taking kind of these familiar archetypes and kind of remixing them to some extent. So my job for today was to go through and find a good description of Baba Yaga, her main traits, etc., and to give everyone a good overview uh, of her as a character. So I think, as I may have said already before, the... Key word for describing Baba Yaga and her role within Russian folklore is ambiguous. This comes down even to the name Baba Yaga, as we will see soon. The first misconception that I kind of found going in is that Baba Yaga isn't really that much of a given name. It honestly seems more like a title from what I've read. So very much when you'll start a story that has Baba Yaga in it, she's not introduced as... Baba Yaga, she's introduced as a Baba Yaga, or the Baba Yaga, or one of several Baba Yagas. Is that what you also encountered, Crofty? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes she seems to be the only one. Sometimes she has several sisters. Or there are versions where Baba Yaga is just used where a Western story might say, a witch. Yeah, because uh, as we'll get into, Baba Yaga was also used like as a shorthand descriptor. Just for like basically like an annoying old woman to some extent during 19th and 18th century Russia, which kind of explains some of its connotations. So, Crofty, I'm going to list some main characteristics of Baba Yaga. Feel free to chime in with any that I miss. So, in most stories, Baba Yaga is an entity that lives in a forest, often found over what is described as Freisnine lands. That's a common phrase that we'll be coming back to. Within this forest, she tends to dwell within a small hut that is described as standing on either chicken or goat legs, and is sometimes also described as having ram horns, although I didn't find that occurring very often in the actual stories that I went ahead and read. This was more from the academic treatise. Now, when the hero or heroine of the story encounters this hut, it's usually turning around constantly. 
at which point the hero will greet it with the traditional phrase of Little Hut, Little Hut, stand with your back to the forest, your front to me, at which point the hut will stop and they will be able to enter. May I add a variant of that? Because one ver- common variant I've I'd read of that was stand as your mother placed you with your front to me and your back to the forest. Yeah, there's there's a few different variants. So some variants just say hut, hut, stand with your back to the forest, your front to me. Others say little hut. Some just say the back to your forest part. So again, lots of different alternatives there to that particular phrase. So inside the hut itself, often the Baba Yaga is described as lying across a stove or simply just being in the hut. Now, when I first read the phrase lying across a stove, to anyone with a modern idea of what a stove or an oven is, that might sound a little strange. I don't know if you had that impression as well, Crofty. Yeah, I literally just pictured what we would see as an oven, which seems a bit strange to have a person lying across because they're not really that kind of size. Yeah, so they're not only they're not really that kind of size, they're also not particularly, um, you know, you can't really lie across an oven without burning yourself in some fashion. My my assumption was that it wasn't lit. <laughs> but in fact, those stoves would have been lit because what we're actually talking about here is a Russian stove, which is a very different beast from the Western idea of a stove. So a Russian stove is a much, much larger stove that would be kind of almost built into Russian houses to act not only as the main source of cooking, but also as the main heating source for the entire house. So it wouldn't be uncommon for a Russian stove to weigh upwards of two tons, if you understand the kind of scale that that would involve. And rather than having like an external heated surface, like most Western ideas of a grill or anything like that, Russian stoves kind of act by diffusing heat throughout the whole body of the stove. And the outside surface of the stove as a result is, you know, generally just kind of warm to the touch. It is perfectly tolerable to touch. So... In Russian society, especially of kind of the 19th and 18th centuries, it wouldn't be uncommon for a family in the very harsh Russian winters to actually sleep on top of the stove because it'd just be pleasantly warm and it would heat everyone. So that's kind of the image that's probably better to have in your mind and probably why Baba Yaga is described as lying across the stove as a result. That makes much more sense now. So Baba Yaga herself... You know, in addition to being described as lying across the stove, she's usually described as having a number of monstrous characteristics. So the common element is almost always that her nose is so long that it's described as having grown into the ceiling itself. And in addition, you also get things like uh, like more monstrous attributes, so things like swollen breasts and hips. And a lot of the stories make mention of her having either iron teeth or being of great height as well. So a common nickname associated with Baba Yaga when she's introduced is often Baba Yaga Bony Leg. I think you might have seen that one, Crofty. Yeah, yeah, I have. So there are a few variants on it. There is, you know, Baba Yaga Golden Leg, Baba Yaga Clay Leg, Baba Yaga Iron Leg, etc. These may sound kind of a little bit odd in their direct translation to English. If you look at them in the original Russian, these are rhyming elements. So... You know, bony leg does rhyme with Baba Yaga in the original Russian. In addition to possibly describing Baba Yaga herself as having a bony leg or being like an identifying characteristic, it could also simply just be like a rhyming device used to aid memory. And then in addition to this, whenever someone enters a hut, a lot of the time, not always, her first comment is on the Russian scent or Russian blood of the person who entered. Yeah, I've come across that one as well. And in fact, Baba Yaga seems to have quite a, a mixed relationship with the Russian people. Not only does she kind of react often with disgust to their scent, she seems to be quite harsh on the Russians. She is kind of constantly expressing disdain for them or setting them hard tasks, etc. And that kind of works very much into the her role as a villain when she's presented as such. So anything major I've kind of missed out about Baba Yaga there, Crofty? Two small things that I will add. Um, Regarding the house, quite often it's depicted in a fenced enclosure where the fence is either made of human bones or is topped with human skull. Yeah. Generally that's reserved for the ones where she is overtly evil. 
Yeah, and some of those tales as well, whenever the hero or heroine arrives at the hut, they will note that there are 12 poles set up, but only 11 of them have skulls on it, hmm. uh, or something to that effect. So uh, it's kind of like a warning to the heroine or hero. Yeah. Uh, the other um, thing I will add regarding the name Bony Leg, in a lot of artwork, she tends to be depicted as her legs literally being only bones, like if a person is described as bony yeah. when you're talking about them in English, then it more just implies that they are very thin as to be almost skeletal. Whereas with Baba Yaga, it is that her lower half is literally just a skeleton in some of these depictions. Oh, right. That makes a little bit more sense now. There's a, there's a few pieces of artwork that do show it that way, where her legs are just bones. I mean, I think that one is still open mm-hmm. to interpretation. It might just be that she is just that thin that, it looks skeletal, but there's some artwork in which it's taken very literally. Yeah, I've seen some uh, arguments in the academic treatise I was talking about where one idea is that like being very skinny during kind of Russian peasant society during the 18th and 19th century was considered like a very negative physical trait. They wanted people who were plump and healthy, in particular women who were like of a robust build and who could bear children, etc. That that seemed to be kind of much of the ideal. So that could be a deliberate negative attribute associated with Baba Yaga. Yeah, considering things like the climate in Russia at the time and you know just, just how harsh it would be living in rural Russia, then that very much makes sense as a negative trait there. So moving beyond Baba Yaga herself, there's a few other common elements to her in the story. The first one is probably that when Baba Yaga has to travel... She often does so in what is termed an iron mortar, or just a mortar. And I'm by when I say that, I mean mortar is in pestle and mortar. And indeed, when she is travelling along in the mortar, she will push herself along with the pestle. And in addition to this, she also uses a broom to brush away any tracks she might leave. So um, again, this could very easily be seen within the context of Russian kind of agrarian life uh, during the period when these tales were being formulated, where Mortars and pestles were quite a useful household instrument for grinding grain and other items that would then be used for cooking. So that that would make sense where, you know, this is a, a relatable element of the character that kind of helped her, her popularity in that she often associated with devices that everyone who's hearing these stories would have a quick common reference point to. Yeah, when I first read that, it seemed really strange. Like, how can she ride around in a mortar? And then I just sort of had to stop for a minute and think in the Western idea of a witch they ride around on broomsticks and that's you know that's considered a standard trope for us for witch stories and so just had to stop and think in russia this would probably be a much more normal idea yeah i mean if it's a a common household object uh, uh, that's uh, been given special significance as a result it's just that the object is you know in our case it turned into a broom in their case it became another household object but as I say, a broom is still involved somewhat in that uh, in in that whole equation. Yeah, I mean, what I'm trying to do at the moment, I'm trying to be careful because it's a very natural thing that happens is that Western audiences tend to apply Western ideas of witches to Baba Yaga, and we're getting perilously close, perilously close to doing that in our interpretation there. So that's one of the things just to keep in mind is you know Baba Yaga is not really in the Western witch mindset so it may be some of the conclusions that we just drew there may be spurious for that reason yeah unfortunately we can't help falling into that trap sometimes yeah yeah so in addition to kind of traveling using a pestle and mortar babiago is also commonly framed as being like a master of animals so often there are like animals uh, like quite often birds and vermin and others that follow her commands and that often are involved in her schemes against a particular hero or heroine or are even simply used to aid the hero or heroine. We'll get into that in a minute. And then alongside that, Baba Yaga is also, I would argue this is almost like a, a character separate from Baba Yaga that is a, in, like intrinsically tied to Baba Yaga, which is Baba Yaga's daughters. So in almost every single story where Baba Yaga is presented as the villain or an unwilling helper character, She has a daughter of some type. In some stories, it can be that she simply has one daughter who is almost more of a servant or a slave than an actual daughter. Or in some stories, such as the one which I read for the first time, she has 40 
uh, 40 plus daughters. And it's never really elaborated on where these daughters came from. There's not really a father figure associated with Baba Yaga. And it's it's kind of one of these just uh, more, again, a quite ambiguous element. And one thing I found very common in the stories I was reading, Crofty, was often Baba Yaga's plans, in, in the plans where the daughters are not explicitly kind of captives or servants, often her plans inadvertently result in the death of her own daughters. Yeah, sometimes by the uh, hero or heroine having to outwit them so as to escape is one of the main reasons from what I found. Yeah. And then I think probably the final two things I really have to say about Baba Yaga is like, as a character as a whole, Baba Yaga, in a lot of the stories where she appears as a villain, she is an explicit abductor of children and women, and she is very much a cannibal. So there's a lot of references to her breaking up people and leaving only the bones behind or threatening to eat people, the heroine or hero when they first encounter her. Sometimes this attempt to cook the heroine or hero is at what almost directly leads to her own downfall. So that's quite an important element where she is depicted as a villain. And then kind of the last thing I wanted to mention was something you touched on before, which is often Baba Yaga is presented not just as the singular Baba Yaga. She's instead presented as one of three women, often old women, who I found when there's more than one Baba Yaga in the stories, the women are generally helper characters, where the heroine is frequently uh, helped by being given silver and gold objects by a group of three women. Sometimes only one of those women is explicitly referred to as the Baba Yaga, usually the oldest of the sisters. Sometimes they're all just described as a group of three women who, despite living in huts like Baba Yaga and having some of her traits, are never explicitly identified as such. So, as we say, Baba Yaga is a very ambiguous figure with lots of different interpretations. Yeah, I think one final thing to add to these various traits is that one of the descriptions that has come up a few times is that she is the mother or grandmother of all witches. Like I think in one of the in one of the stories where there are three Baba Yagas helping the hero, the first one, the oldest one, like you say, is referred to as the grandmother of witches, and then the other two are the grand aunts of witches. That may that may be an element of the stories you got to because I didn't see that in any of the stories I read, but one thing we often had when we were discussing this episode back and forth was I would come to you and say things like, right, I've read enough of the stories now where I feel like I've got all the major archetypes down. And I'd be like, so I've got this, I've got that, I've, I've seen this. And then I'd mention one and you'd be like, oh yeah, and what about this one that I'd never heard of? So I think that might be quite common going forward in this in this episode. Yeah, so we can try and cover as many archetypes as possible, but we we might end up missing a few things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's kind of the overview of the main traits that you're going to find in typical Baba Yaga story associated with her. Some of them may be present, some of them may not be. And yeah, as we said before multiple times, the key word for Baba Yaga is ambiguous. She often has a different guise and different role in many of the different stories. Yeah. What What is interesting about Baba Yaga, though, I found was... She's one of the fr- the few kind of uniquely uh, Slavic folklore characters who is not just kind of a national figure, but also has a lot of international variants as well. So the actual like names that Baba Yaga is known by within Russia, there is a stunning array of different names and variants. So within you know, Russia, the Ukraine, and the Belarus... I know for a fact that there's at least several dozen different names that Andreas Johns listed in the academic treatise. So I'll give a very brief sampling of some of those. But, you know, this this is just a small portion of what's out there as far as I can tell. So within those areas, there are variant forms such as Iga, Ega, Iagaba, Iagabova, Egabova, Ignashma, Iagnishna, Agagishna, Liagiba, Baba Igipuna. There's all sorts, basically. And in, within the academic treatise, there is several pages just listing different variants in different countries. So there are variants in other Eastern Slavic countries. And there are moving beyond that, there's kind of analogues throughout much of Eastern Europe, including figures found in places like Poland, Czech Republic, 
I think Lithuania has its own example, and Crofty, you were mentioning there's a Finnish example as well. Yeah, yeah, I'll go into that in full in a bit, but there's two Finnish examples that might be related to Baba Yaga. Yeah. So despite you know having all these different variants across most of Eastern Europe, so there was examples again from places like Bulgaria, Albania, of characters with similar names who fulfill similar roles, some of them more explicitly the same character than, as Baba Yaga than others. With all that said, the most common name within Russia itself is Baba Yaga. It's the, the kind of more national name out of all the variant regions. And the name itself poses difficulties. So the first word, Baba, is not particularly hard to assign a meaning to or where it's derived from. According to Andres John's, Baba in most Slavic-derived languages is widely understood to mean a kind of a, a general grandmotherly figure, or to be used describing an old woman, or even just a married woman. So I have noticed some variants of some of the stories I read where you know an old woman was referred to as having children, and that may be a translation error where what they actually mean is just a married woman. But that's kind of what most people would understand the word Baba to mean. So in Old Russian, it would have meant like a midwife, a sorceress, or a fortune teller. And in more modern Russian, it's also the source of the uh, of the word for, like the standardized Russian word for grandmother, which is babushka. So as I say, Baba is not that difficult to figure out where it came from. The Yaga part is more difficult. There are different interpretations by different linguists that I could find, and basically its meaning, whilst disputed, has been associated with a wide range of negative attributes. So in many Slavic languages, it and the equivalents that I mentioned before are used as shorthand for for you know illness, disease, anger, evil female beings, wood nymphs, dryads, so in dialectic Russian, the verb yagat means to yell, make a noise, rage or curse or squabble. And there's also a lot of similar kind of Indo-European words that have similar negative connotations with pain and worry. So there is no real agreed upon definition for the word yaga. And there's a lot of different interpretations out there. Ultimately, Andreas John's conclusion was that there just isn't really enough solid information that you can take from it to pinpoint to one particular meaning, and that as a whole, you can't really point to Baba Yaga's name as a sign of where her origin kind of came from, or have ha- as having one singular meaning, other than that the words themselves seem to just have some generally negative connotations. So do you think that more modern usage of words that derive from Yaga, do you think that might have come that might have come from association with Baba Yaga, which was how it got those negative meanings, or do you think it might have been the other way around? Or is that just something that we can't speculate on at all? Well we'll get into that in a minute. Um what I will say is that around the time that these stories were being collated, so again we're talking, you know, kind of nineteenth century Russia, the term Baba Yaga was apparently like known throughout Russia not only as part of the story of the tale character, but also as a byword for an old, quarrelsome, or ugly woman. So, yeah, it definitely seems that at least by that point there were negative associations between those terms. We'll get a little bit more into some of the potential origin points for her in a minute. So, in terms of the exact origins of Baba Yaga and when she has been documented, we have a strange situation where from the way that Baba Yaga is discussed in the earliest sources and also some pictographic representations, it's clear that Baba Yaga is a much older character than the documentary evidence uh, suggests. The actual first textual reference for Baba Yaga comes to us from the 18th century, which is, is pretty late considering some of the potential origin ideas about Baba Yaga. So, the earliest actual depiction of her doesn't come from the 18th century. It comes from slightly earlier. It comes from the late 17th century. This is in a series of woodcuts known as Lubki, which were kind of popular during the late 17th century. And a subset of these Lubki feature a figure that has been identified as Baba Yaga. So you may well have seen these images, Crofty, 
um, doing your own research for it. So probably the most well-known of these prints is a figure of Baba Yaga riding a pig and fighting a male figure that is known as the crocodile. Yeah. He's not, you know, he's not obviously a crocodile by any textual reference. He just has been kind of nicknamed that by the fact that he's kind of this male figure with a beard, claws, and he has an obvious animal body and tail as well. So that's kind of one of the earliest depictions that we're pretty confident is supposed to represent Baba Yaga. There are a couple of interpretations of this wood print. The most common interpretation I saw during the course of my research is that this woodprint is not, you know, depicting a scene for any particular Baba Yaga story. What it actually may be is a satire of contemporary Russian politics. In particular, the late 18th century, the Tsar of the time was Peter the Great, who was very much a moderniser of his country. He got a he kind of got rid of a lot of older court practices, tried to modernise the infrastructure of his country on a more Western line. And what it's thought is that this woodprint may actually be depicting like a, a satirical scene of a conflict between him and his wife, who was a, I think she was a Polish woman by the name of Catherine, who actually ended up being Peter's successor on the throne as Empress. Peter did initially have a male heir, and he also had a daughter as well, I think who was called Anna, but um, he actually made uh, Catherine his successor within his own lifetime, and his male heir actually predeceased him. Uh, mostly because, I can't remember if it was torture or outright execution, but Peter basically had him put to death, I think, for leading some sort of revolt against him. So that probably gives you an idea of what sort of man Peter the Great was. Yeah. If he's willing to see his own heir killed. Yeah, probably not the nicest of people. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, so that's one interpretation of this woodprint. Another interpretation of it is that it's depicting Baba Yaga in association with kind of Finnish uh, cultural and shamanistic practices, which apparently were still being followed to some extent. Now, at the time, people from Finland, whilst Finland was kind of part of the Russian Empire or was... Uh, soon to be part of the Russian Empire, I can't exactly remember whether Sweden still owned it or not at the time, was they, they were seen very negatively by your average Russian, as was the kind of Russian, sorry, the Finnish kind of cultural dress which Baba Yaga is depicted in in this scene. And what's also interesting is that the pejorative term for Finnish people, which is uh, Chukonka, I think, of the time, was applied to uh, Catherine as well. So, there may be a mixture of the two things going on there. So another one of these wood prints that is quite popular is also a wood print that shows Baba Yaga dancing to a man playing the bagpipes. I think you may have seen this one as well, Crofty, because I think that's one of the first things I ran across when I looked into it. Yeah, yeah, I found that one quite early on as well. And that again, the interpretations of that are split along those lines. So either it's a case of here's another scene from Peter's life that is considered to be depicting a more happy scene of his life, or it may be, again, another unflattering depiction of shamanism, particularly amongst the finno ugric peoples of the era. So that's kind of the first pictorial representation of Baba Yaga. The first textual reference to Baba Yaga is a very interesting one, and it dates from, I think, 1755. So it appears as part of a list of folklore figures and deities that were drawn up by a Russian poet by the name of Mikhail Lomonosov. This list is an interesting list. So the first part of it is organised into two separate sections which compare Russian and Slavic figures with the Roman equivalent deities. So like there is a, a Slavic equivalent for Jupiter and various other Roman figures. Baba Yaga does not appear in these two sections. She appears in a third section where she has no Roman equivalent listed. So as to any original role for Baba Yaga within kind of pagan belief systems, we again are left somewhat wanting. There's no clear equivalent that we could very easily slot her into from a, a Western or even an Indo-European mythology standpoint. So after this reference to her, 
Baba Yaga also appears in a number of literature of uh, literary fa uh, fairy tales throughout the late point of the 18th century. So a lot of these are by figures such as uh, Vasily Levshini, Dmitry Petrovich Gorchakov, and a man by the name of Mikhail uh, Makarov, who composed various poems and literary works which included Baba Yaga in them as a character or as a potential villain. And already Baba Yaga in those stories has many of her common traits. So the example I have here of one of these stories is by Vasily Levshin, which is the tale of the noble Zeola Shanin, a knight in the service of Prince Vladimir. This combines both kind of more folkloric representations of Baba Yaga and his own imagination. So in this story, he depicts Baba Yaga is kidnapping a maiden, and she is then fought off by the hero of the story and slain. So the exact passage I have here is, Suddenly a great whirlwind arose, the trees made way on both sides, and I saw Baba Yaga galloping in a mortar that she urged on like a horse with an iron pestle. Her appearance was so frightening that I started trembling when I saw her, and how could one not be frightened? imagining a very dark and thin woman, seven arshins high. So an arshin is 28 inches. So very, very tall is what they're trying to say. With teeth one and a half arshins long, sticking out on both sides like a wild boar. Her hands adorned with bear claws. She came up, seized me, and rushed me off with her. The sky darkened from the great number of ravens, kites, and owls that flew in. They circled over Baba Yaga's courtyard letting out a nasty cry which must cause one to feel horror even before the witch's arrival. But she didn't give the knights time for considerations, and appeared in her mortar. She intensified her blows with the pestle, driving on this carriage of hers. Her eyes were like red-hot coals, bloody foam flowed from her mouth, and her fangs made a dreadful noise when they scraped. Oh-ho! she roared, jumping from her mortar and throwing aside her pestle. I can hardly wait for you, Zenislav. I'll eat well now and you came to take away my precious booty, and you came at the right time. I'm very hungry. So yeah, a depiction there of Baba Yaga in very much the villainous role that we will see, hopefully, Crofty. Yeah, the specification of her height is interesting, because that works out as, what, more than 15 feet? Yeah, pretty tall, pretty tall. It's like a two and a, two and a half feet, more or less, for each Arshan, so... Yeah, it explains a few things like later on where she... Um, where she just casually beats up a giant in one of the stories that I have. Yeah, that would make more sense. Um, so ha having her as 15 foot tall now makes a bit more sense there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this story is also interesting, and it gives what I'd almost call the earliest origin story that I came across for Baba Yaga. So as far as we can tell, this is entirely an invention of Lev Shin himself. So according to him, uh, Baba Yaga's origin is that the devil wishing to concoct the most perfect essence of evil, cooked twelve nasty women together in a cauldron. To capture the essence, he gathered the steam in his mouth and then spat into the cauldron without thinking. Out of this mixture came Baba Yaga, the most perfect evil. So this does appear in an anomalous, uh, like one, in one other folk tale, but it's difficult to tell if he actually knew about this folk tale. So outside of kind of these poetic uh, references and tales that were like made around that time, uh, probably the most um, famous depiction of Baba Yaga is from uh, Alexander Pushkin's opening to his epic poem Ruslan and Ludmilla. So I do have an excerpt from this as well. So in this section he says, On seashore far a green oak towers, and to it with a golden chain bound, a learned cat whiles away the hours by walking slowly round and round. To the right he walks and sings a ditty, to the left he walks and tells a tale. What marvels there, a mermaid sitting high in a tree, a sprite, a trail where unknown beasts move never seen by man's eyes, a hut on chicken feet, without doors, without windows, an evil witch's lone retreat. The woods and valleys there are teeming, with strange things. Dawn brings waves that gleaming over the sandy beaches creep, and from the clear and shining water step thirty goodly knights escorted by their old guardian of the deep. An ancient dweller, there a dreaded and hated Tsar is captive Tayen, 
I don't know what that word means. There as all watch for Cloudbank's headed, across the sea and o'er a plain, a warlock bears a knight. There weeping, a princess sits locked in a cell, and Grey Wolf serves her very well. There in a mortar, onward sweeping, all of itself beneath the skies, the wicked Baba Yaga flies, there pines Koshche and lust for gold. So that reference is interesting for a couple of factors. Um, I found it interesting because it describes Baba Yaga as flying in the mortar by itself. She doesn't need to use the pestle at all. And the other thing as well is it mentions another kind of national Russian folklore figure, which is, is it Koshche the Deathless or Koshche the Immortal? Yeah, um, my understanding of the pronunciation was just Koshche. Koshche, right, yeah. But I, I could be wrong on that. That's just how I've heard it. Yeah, we, I mean, I, I think at the way we're probably going to go with some of these Russian translations, um, the next episode will probably be me recording from Siberia as penance <laughs> for messing things up. <laughs> I think uh, with how the last one went, but yeah, yeah, so that's that's kind of the the main poems and literary works from this period. There are a number of others, but so actually, I've have just realised I missed out one story earlier um, that actually was written down in 1782, which is by a author by the name of Mikhail Shul- Shulkov, and that's very much in the vein of the kind of like more pagan side of things. So this is a dictionary of Russian superstitions, which um, basically writes down the following about Baba Yaga, and it explicitly says that the Slavs venerated the underworld goddess by this name, representing her as a frightening figure seated in an iron mortar. With an iron pestle in her hands, they made blood sacrifice to her, thinking that she fed it to the two granddaughters they attributed to her, and that she delighted in the shedding of blood herself. So that's another earlier kind of uh, superstitious story to do with Baba Yaga. From a more mythological standpoint, there wasn't really a concerted effort, as far as we can tell, to find the folklore tales associated with Baba Yaga and write them down until the 19th century, specifically that, like the mid-19th century. And there were a number of people to thank for this task. The two major figures that most collections of Baba Yaga stories come to are the tales that were collected by either Alexander Afanashev or another figure by the name of Ivan Kudyakov. So the first of these, Alexander Afanashev, is almost what I would call the Russian equivalent to the Brothers Grimm in Germany, where they're probably the best known example of people who made a really concerted effort to collect European folklore tales together and kind of edited them into much of their modern forms. And he kind of performed a similar role for Russian folklore. So he published an eight-volume series by the name of Russian Folk Tales between the years of 1855 and 1866, which contained some 600 different tales. And this is kind of where many of the stories that I read in that collection I mentioned came from. So you'll often get to the end of them and it will say something like Afanasyev 105. Often any original titles to these stories are made up by the later compilers and people who've collected them. And within the actual uh, kind of folkloric exploration of these topics, they're listed by a specific number and the person who recorded them. So in addition to him, there's also the work Great Russian Fairy Tales that was produced by Kudyakov in 1861. I'd say the distinction from what I could tell between these two authors is Afanashev didn't really collate the stories in person. He didn't go out into the Russian countryside and write down the stories as told to him. He instead relied on oral stories that had previously been recorded and that were kind of held in the Geographical Society of Moscow's archives. And not only that, he also himself kind of edited and expanded out some of these stories as well. So often you'll find a similar story recorded by him and by other authors who his version is much more elaborate and expanded. And the opposite side of this scale is Kudyakov's stories where he very much went out amongst the Russian peasantry and recorded these in person. And the result of his work is that his versions not only being kind of shorter and snappier, they're also often more satirical in nature and often contain a lot more kind of like scatological elements that just aren't seen in Afanasyev's works. 
if you like keeping those two distinctions between those authors in mind you also have to take into account that a lot of these early stories were written down in a period of very heavy censorship by the russian authorities so uh, many of these stories were likely heavily edited to remove anything anti-clerical politically subversive or scatological and just generally the government was very suspicious of peasant stories for the simple reason that um they kind of reinforced a lot of kind of pagan and supernatural beliefs that existed outside of the contemporary church doctrine. So with those factors in mind regarding these stories, the works of these two figures really form the main kind of corpus of the Bagiaga material that have received kind of more Western scrutiny. So that's really everything I wanted to say about the background to Baba Yaga and her stories. Um, there is a vast body of literature trying to interpret Baba Yaga uh, to elucidate where her potential origin may have come from that has gone through a long range of um, different interpretations over the course of Russian history. So you had inter interpretations in the Tsarist era, kind of the revolutionary era, Stalinist and Soviet Russia era, and kind of 90s onwards, uh, Russian Federation, and after the breakup of the Soviet Union. I think that would have sidetracked us a lot, Crofty, so I'm not going to go into any of that today. I think from this point onwards, what would be probably best for us to do is to actually just get into some of these original folkloric stories and uh, look at some of their major archetypes. Yeah, yeah. So did you have one that you wanted to start us off with, and then I'll take over? Yeah. I'm going to kick things off with the one story that I actually read back when I first came across Baba Yaga. So I don't actually know... If this title is directly linked to the story by uh, the earlier authors, I know it is by it is one that was collated by Afanasyev. I think it's listed as Afanasyev 105. But in the collection that I read, it was listed as Baba Yaga and the Runt. So the basic synopsis of this story is that it starts in a very fairy tale way. There once lived an old woman and a man who had no children. They both prayed to God as hard as they could, but no matter how hard they prayed, the woman did not bear any children. However, one day, whilst the old man was out picking mushrooms in the woods, he ran across another old man, who said to him, I know what's in your thoughts. You keep thinking about children. Go through the village, collect one egg from each household, and then put a brood hen atop the eggs. So the old man collected the eggs, and did as he was told, and he collected a total of 41 eggs from other households and put them under a brood hen. So two weeks later, he came back and he found that the eggs had hatched into 41 young boys, which he explicitly says 40 of them were young, strong lads, but one of them was a small weakling. So the old man gave all of his new sons names, but by the time he reached the weakling, he ran out of names. Uh, so he says, well, you can be called Runt. So the boys grew up, not by days as it says, but by hours, and very quickly were able to work in the fields for their father, and by the time it got to be the time of the year for haymaking, the brothers worked for a solid week and raked together 40 different haystacks before they finally lay down to sleep. So the old man, after being very proud of his son's work, goes out the next morning into the meadows to admire all these well put together haystacks, and finds that one of them has disappeared. On returning home, he asks the boys if any of them know where this last haystack has gone, and the one who speaks up is Runt. And he says, Don't worry, Dad, we'll catch the thief. Give me a hundred roubles and I will do it. So the old man gives him a hundred roubles, and Runt runs off and goes to a blacksmith, where he orders the blacksmith to forge him a chain, long enough to wrap a person from head to foot. So the blacksmith forges a chain, but when Runt wraps it around himself and stretches it, it snaps. So the blacksmith duly forges another chain, and this time after Runt stretches it around himself, it holds. So he pays the blacksmith his hundred rubles, and then he goes off and he hides under one of the haystacks to guard them. And at the stroke of midnight, the sea around the village grows rough, and a marvellous mare emerges from its depths and runs up to devour the hay. The runt then jumps out and bridles her with the chain, and no matter how hard the mare bucks, she can't get runt off her, 
and despite carrying him over hill and dale, she cannot shake him off. So eventually she stops, and she says to him, Well, good lad, since you've kept your seat on me, then you must take my falls and break them. So the mare and Runt run up to the sea, and there she neighs loudly, and calls forth forty-one fine stallions from within the waves who come to shore. So Runt rides this whole herd home, where he arrives and addresses his brothers, and says, Hi there, brothers. Now there's a horse for each of us. Let's ride together to find brides for ourselves. So after getting their mother and father's blessing, the brothers set out to find their own brides. They ride for a long time, but they struggle to find any brides because they don't want to get married separately, but obviously there's no, very few mothers who are going to have 41 daughters for them to marry. So they ride off over what, again, is described as Freisnein lands, and come to a palace of white stone situated on a steep mountain, and that is surrounded by a high wall with 41 iron columns placed within it. They fasten their horses to the pillars, and here the horses are described with a common element within these stories, which is where they're described as bogatier horses. To make the obvious Western comparison, the bogatier are kind of a, a similar group to kind of the Knights of the Round Table or the Knights Errant, where they were kind of the elite soldiers of, I think, a prince of Kiev by the name of, I think it was Vladimir the Great. But generally... As best I can understand, the term bogatier horse within these stories generally just means like a good quality cavalry horse. So, after fastening their horses to the pillars, the 41 men go into the courtyard where a Baba Yaga comes out to meet them. And she says to them, Ah, you, uncalled and uninvited, how dare you hit your horses without permission? To which they respond with, Well, old woman, what are you shouting for? First give us something to eat and drink take us to the bathhouse, then ask us afterwards for our news. So this is kind of, co of a common element that shows up in many of the stories I read, like where a hero will interrupt Baggy Yaga's initial questions by asking her for hospitality. And often this is kind of paired to contemporary Russian ideas of hospitality, where it's considered bad faith to turn out and mistreat a stranger who has asked for your hospitality. Yeah, that trait goes back to quite a lot of cultures over history, probably even further back than the Greeks. It's quite a common one wherever you go that if you request hospitality and it's refused, that's generally considered an evil act on the part of the person refusing the hospitality. Yeah, I, I think we all recognise that even if it's just, you know, simple elements like uh, within uh, biblical stories and that sort of thing. I think um, that that wouldn't be surprised me if that is kind of like a, almost an Indo-European derived thing but as you say it's seen in other cultures around the world so it may just be like a general part of uh of human folkloric traditions yeah so after baba yaga does so she you say feeds them takes them to the back house she then asks them for the news and he says what is what is it good news are you doing a deed or fleeing a deed and that is another phrase that Baba Yaga often uh, opens conversations with by saying, are you doing a deed or fleeing a deed? Often it's said to a heroine, I've found, where uh, the heroine is explicitly coming to Baba Yaga for help. Yeah, I've found versions where where it's, um, are you, you here of your own will or by compulsion? Yeah, that's another variant as well I've seen. Um, so the brothers tell Baba Yaga, we're here seeking wives. To which Baba Yaga says, I have daughters. So she goes into the palace and she brings out 41 daughters. So the men are overjoyed and they get engaged right away and begin to celebrate. But that evening, uh, when Runt uh, goes to see, like, goes to check in on his horse that he has harnessed, the horse speaks to him and says, Look out, master. When you lie down to sleep, dress your new wives in your clothes and put on your wives' clothes yourselves. Otherwise, we'll all be lost. So Runt goes back to his brothers and tells them to do so, so they swap clothes with Babiaga's daughters. At that point, they all go to bed, but Runt himself stays awake to see what's happening. So at the stroke of midnight, Babiaga shouts, My faithful servants, cut the heads off these uninvited guests. So her servants come running, run into the room, and they cut off all of her daughter's heads that are dressed in the men's clothes. After this has happened, Runt wakes up his brothers, and they take the heads, 
uh, stick them on the iron spikes around the wall, and then they all ride off in great haste. So in the morning, Babiaga wakes up, and she goes, and she sees her daughter's head stuck upon the spikes. In great wrath, she orders her fiery shield to her, and she rides off in pursuit. What's interesting to me is that they don't identify her as riding in a pestle or mortar in this story, so it appears to be another variant, or it was like presumed on behalf of the audience, potentially, that they, they would know that that's what Babiaga rides in. After riding off in pursuit, she shoots fire from her shield in all four directions, and the, the fine lads, as they're called, kind of go, what, what are we to do? Where are we to hide from this? And they come across the blue, the blue sea, uh, with Baba Yaga rapidly coming up behind them, shooting and burning. And it is at this point that Runt has a good idea. So he had previously, it turns out, taken a handkerchief from Baba Yaga's palace, and at this point he waves it in front of him, and a great bridge springs up and stretches across all of the whole blue sea. So the lads then ride across it to the other side, Runt waves the handkerchief in the other direction, and the bridge disappears. So at this point, Baba Yaga reaches the sea, sees that she can't, pa can't pass, and goes back. And the brothers ride off to home. And that's, that's just where it ends. So, yeah, very simple, very uh, kind of um, archetypical story of Baba Yaga. It's got many of the elements in there that we mentioned beforehand. And I just wanted to mention it because it's the only one I'd read before this. So I had like a personal attachment to it. And now, doing more research, I guess you're seeing how many of these tropes are showing up elsewhere, like request for hospitality, things like the handkerchief creating a bridge is quite a common one. Yeah, I mean, there's like um, one element we haven't really spoken about, and I assume will show up more in your stories, is the um, the element where like items are taken from Baba Yaga and they're used as like obstacles for her. So like someone throwing an item behind them and a great forest springing up or something like that. So we already see some element of that with the handkerchief in this. So we see Baba Yaga's daughters, we see like the spiked heads and the iron gates and all this sort of stuff. So yeah, I think that gives you people like a like a, a good understanding and uh, of how these various tropes are woven into the different stories before we move now on to some of the more broader tale types. Yeah, yeah. Is this the point where we hand over to me? Yeah, I'm gonna hand over to you now, Crofty. Okay, thank you. So I'm quite glad that you chose that particular story there, Charles, because it does cover one of the archetypes that weren't in the four archetypes that I'm going to focus on, because I've not actually managed to find very many stories which have Baba Yaga as sort of someone that the hero encounters, requests help from, and she then betrays him. The only other variant of that, that I know of is a variant of one of the most, probably one of the most famous Russian stories, the story of Koshe the Deathless, who we mentioned earlier on. Yeah, Koshe is uh, an interesting one, isn't he? Because he shows up much like Baba Yaga in a whole bunch of different stories. Yeah, so the one that is fairly well known outside of outside of Russia and Eastern Europe is the story of Koshe and Maya Morevna. So while well, I'm not going to go into detail on this story because it is a huge story and Baba Yaga only has a relatively small role, the warrior princess Maya Morevna is kidnapped by Koshe the Deathless, and her husband, who sometimes is Prince Ivan and sometimes is Prince Alexei, has to attempt to rescue her. And he requests the help of Baba Yaga. He requests that Baba Yaga provide him with her fastest horse. And almost all variants of it, he has to complete trials in order to prove himself worthy. Some variants, she agrees to give him the horse after he completes the trials, because, as we mentioned earlier, she has an ongoing enmity with Koshe, but there are some versions of that where after he completes the trial, she then betrays him, tries to kill him, and he just has to steal whatever horse he can find from her stable and escape. Yeah, that's just a to shortly summarize that variant of Baba Yaga from that story, because like I say, Koshe himself could merit a whole episode at a later date. Yeah, Koshe often appears as like a, a villainous rival for the hero, for the well, almost the affections of the heroine, but kind of like a almost a captor in many ways. And his, his name is an interesting one because it's not always a case of, you know, he's it's not like an outright case of he's immortal. It's usually a case of he's like taken his death and placed it in something else that then the hero must track down and restore to him before killing him, etc. 
Yeah, yeah, it's either specified as his heart or his soul, but it sometimes is literally specified as his death, like whether that's like the moment of his death or something like that. And that's why the title tends to be the deathless rather than the immortal. He's not technically immortal. He has no death, which is an interesting take on it, I found. Yeah. I mean, I, I did notice in a couple of the stories I read, I read of, of like a, a version with that with Princess Maya and Prince Ivan, where I think uh, the version I read at the beginning, uh, he'd already captured, like Princess Maya had actually captured him and Prince Ivan inadvertently lets him free and that's when the conflict happens, as you described. But in that version, they don't even restore his death to him. They just kill him at the end and no, exp- don't explain it, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's a interesting one that unfortunately don't think we have time to go into the ins and outs of it today so moving on to a story which is Baba Yaga centric the first one that I want to talk about is known as Baba Yaga and the girl with the kind heart I found this one in a book called Old Peter's Russian Tales translated into English by Arthur Ransom in I think 1913 they all have the framing story of a grandfather old Peter telling his two grandchildren bedtime stories. And one night, the grandchildren request from a story about Baba Yaga, and he mentions Vasilisa the Beautiful, which is the final one I'm going to go into later on, and is the other particularly commonly known one in the West. But the one he tells, Baba Yaga, very much fills the role of the evil witch, and there's very little ambiguity to her. So in this story, there is a widowed old man and his young daughter, who live in a hut in rural Russia. And while for quite some time they lived fairly happily together, the old man eventually took another wife. The girl's new stepmother was very abusive to her. She was always blaming the girl for everything that went wrong. She was beating her. The girl went from you know being served fresh bread by her grandfather to being left outside in the cold, only to eat burnt crusts and leftovers. And yet, when the girl told her father all this, her father wouldn't believe that his new wife would treat his daughter that way. He scolded her for lying instead. So at mealtimes, the girl would hide in a small shed in the yard with her bread crusts every day until one day a small mouse came into the hut and joined her. So the girl gives the mouse a little piece of her bread crust and then another and another and eventually feeds the mouse the entire crust and goes hungry herself. The mouse thanks her for this and says that because she's been kind to him, he will give her a warning about her new stepmother that her stepmother is the sister of Baba Yaga, the bony-legged witch, and that if the stepmother ever sends the girl with a message to her aunt that she was to come and tell the mouse that Baba Yaga would eat her with her iron teeth if she did not know what to do. The very next day, the stepmother tells the girl to go to her aunt in the forest and fetch a needle and thread so that she can mend a shirt. The girl protests that they have a needle and thread here, but the stepmother says, I told you to do a job. Firstly, you must follow the road to a fallen tree, turn left, and then follow your nose, and you will find Baba Yaga. So she gives the girl a towel that's tied up that she says contains food for the road. And then as the girl leaves, she watches her walk down the road out of sight, so she can't go to the hut and tell the mouse. However, when she finds the fallen tree and she turns left, the mouse appears ahead of her. So she tells the mouse what happened, and she doesn't know what to do. The mouse tells her that escaping from Baba Yaga wouldn't be difficult for her because of her kind heart. The mouse says that you are to take all of the things you find on the road and do with them what you like. Then you will escape from Baba Yaga and everything will be well. The girl offers the mouse some of her food, so they sit down to eat, and she opens the towel and finds that there's nothing but rocks. She apologises to the mouse for there being nothing to eat, but the mouse just replies, isn't there? And when she looks back, the rocks are turned into bread and jam. So they eat the meal, and afterwards the mouse tells her to keep the towel because it will be useful to her later. On the road to Baba Yaga's hut, she finds various items. She finds a nice handkerchief, she finds a bottle of oil, she finds some scraps of meat, she finds a pretty blue ribbon, and she finds a loaf of bread. When she comes to Baba Yaga's hut, there's a high fence surrounding it. When she opens the gate, the gates squeak very loudly. So she uses the bottle of oil on the hinges. Within the little yard is Baba Yaga's hut, stood on its chicken legs, and Baba Yaga's servant. The servant is crying because of all the tasks that Baba Yaga makes her do, and how badly Baba Yaga treats her, and she's just wiping her eyes on a petticoat. So the girl then gives the servant the handkerchief that she found. 
As she approaches the hut, there's a large, very thin, hungry-looking dog guarding the door. So the girl gives the dog a loaf of bread. When she enters the hut, Baba Yaga, um, yeah, she is described, as we've talked about before, you know, large, bony-legged, massive nose, taking up a lot of the hut. And she's sat at, she sat at a loom, weaving. She's, at first, acting very politely to her niece. And she asks, Ask the girl to help with her weaving while she finds a needle and thread. So the girl sits at the loom and weaves as Baba Yaga leaves the room, and she overhears Baba Yaga telling her servant to heat up the bath so that she can clean the girl before cooking her. And the girl catches the servant and asks the servant to work very slowly and to carry the water in a sieve. The servant agrees because of her kindness, the servant agrees to help her. Baba Yaga keeps on asking, Are you weaving, my pretty? as she makes ready, and the girl keeps responding, I'm weaving, auntie. The girl then sees a cat sat by a mouse hole waiting. The cat, again, is quite thin and obviously looks hungry. He tells the girl that he hasn't eaten for three days, and so she gives him the meat. The cat then says that he will help her too. He tells the girl to take the comb from her hair and the towel that she got earlier and run while Baba Yaga is in the bathhouse. When Baba Yaga chases her, she must throw away the towel and it will turn into a wide river. If Baba Yaga makes it across the river, she must then throw the comb and it will grow into a large forest that Baba Yaga will never be able to get through. The cat then takes over at the loom. As the girl then flees from the house, the dog at first leaps up to attack until he realises that it's the girl who gave him the loaf. And so he lets her pass. The gates that have now been oiled open quietly. A birch tree opposite the gates tries to catch her in its branches, but she ties the ribbon around it, and it's so pleased with the ribbon that it lets her go, and she flees. When Baba Yaga realises that it's the cat that's weaving, not the girl, um, she angrily demands what to know why the servant and the cat helped her, why the dog let her go, why the gates didn't stop her, and why the tree didn't stop her. And all of them say that Baba Yaga treated them very cruelly while the girl showed them kindness. So, Baba Yaga gets in her mortar, and she beats it with her pestle and gives chase. When the girl sees her, she throws down the towel, and it turns into a river, and Baba Yaga's mortar nearly sinks. But it's interesting here that the mortar isn't actually flying, it seems to be sort of bouncing along the ground. Whereas before, it did seem to be flying. So, anyway, so Baba Yaga rushes back to her hut, and she drives all of her cattle to the river and forces them to drink it dry, and she carries on chasing. The girl then throws down the comb, and a forest so thick grows that Baba Yaga can't force her way through. Upon reaching home, the mouse tells the girl that her father's back, and she must tell him everything. And so upon telling her father the, the story of what just happened, father finally believes that her stepmother is evil, and kicks the stepmother out, and the mouse comes to live with the girl and her father, and they all live happily ever after. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one, yeah. Yeah, so it's an example where Baba Yaga is very obviously the villain. There is nothing ambiguous. Yeah, I've read a couple of variants on that story myself. I think the first one I read was the same setup where it was uh, the like, evil stepmother, but the evil stepmother also has her own daughter that she brings to the marriage. And uh, one day, as you say, she sends her the stepdaughter to Baba Yaga for a task. And I think the versions I read, I read a couple of different versions. One version, she visits another older woman who is like uh, her father's sister rather than her de- stepmother's sister, uh, who helps her then before she goes to see the Baba Yaga, who herself actually has a lot of the characteristics of Baba Yaga. So again, dualistic nature of Baba Yaga going on within the same story. And then there was another version I read where the stepmother sends the stepdaughter off to Baba Yaga who is her aunt but Baba Yaga is a much fairer character so she sets her like the various sewing and sweeping and bathhouse operating tasks but because she excels at them she lets her off and rewards her and sends her back home and turns and like describes her as like turning her into like a great princess whereas you know she returns home and the stepmother sees her and goes well I that's horrible. I want that for my daughter. So she sends her her own daughter off to see Baba Yaga. And that daughter doesn't know how to do the tasks which Baba Yaga gives her, the sewing and 
uh, cleaning up and cooking and all this, which basically would have been traits expected of a good Russian peasant woman of the time. So there's a bit of a parable version going on there. And for not doing these tasks, Baba Yaga breaks up the stepmother's daughter and leaves her bones behind. So, yeah, there's um, dualistic nature going on there again. Yeah, what the one variant that um, I remember from that, it also specified that the stepmother had a dog, and the dog said that a, a, fi a fine lady is approaching when the first daughter came back, and the dog was beaten for lying. And then later on, the dog then says, um, a bag of bones is coming when the remains of the second daughter are returned. Yeah, and I think... Um... One, the the first version I read of that story, which is the much more abrupt one, um, it actually ends. I, I don't have the exact sentence in front of me, but it ends with like this glorious sequence of lines where the stepdaughter comes back to her father, and the father, and it's like the father was very pleased to see that his daughter was back. He took his gun and shot his wife. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> In fairness, the way some of these wives treat their stepdaughters and actively try and get them killed, it's understandable. <laughs> it's, I mean, maybe not in that one where it was just sending her to go and work for Baba Yaga, but... Well, she was deliberately sending her to Baba Yaga so that Baba Yaga would kill her. It's just that Baba Yaga was much more fair to her than anticipated, so... Yeah, yeah. And there's the... One of the stories I'm going to focus on later, that sort of aspect of Baba Yaga having a sense of fairness and punishing the selfish people, but being being helpful to the kind people does come into play in quite a serious way. But yeah, the common thread with a lot of the versions where a girl has to go to Baba Yaga in the woods for help, whether it's being sent there in order to deliberately get her killed or being sent there because she actually needs the help, is that kindness is rewarded. Whereas selfishness isn't, like, this version, the important thing is that this girl is kind to everyone and everything that she meets, and so they all band together to help her against Baba Yaga. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's also a version where, where it's the girl's intelligence that's praised. So when she arrives at Baba Yaga's hut, there's Baba Yaga and her two daughters. Yeah. And Baba Yaga orders her daughters to put her in the oven while she's pretending to find a needle and thread. But with both daughters, the girl plays dumb when the daughter tells her to sit in the pan and says, I don't know how, show me. The daughter sits in the pan and the girl puts her in the oven. And Baba Yaga then eats her own daughter and dances on its bones. And it's then revealed she didn't eat the girl that she thought she was going to eat. Then after, after killing both daughters and making Baba Yaga eat them, the girl's aided by a flock of geese who carry her back to her father. Yeah. I've read some versions of that myself. I've read a few versions where not only does the heroine do in both the daughters by the same method, but then Baba Yaga falls for the same one and is herself cooked. Yeah. I've also read, I've read a version where it's not a heroine, it's a baby that's been abducted by Baba Yaga. And the baby's like, they try and put him in the pan and he like lies with one leg over the edge of the pan and stuff. And they're like, no, not like that. And then, yeah, it leads to the, the same version as what you were saying. Yeah, that seems to be a common one, tricking Baba Yaga into cooking somebody else, namely her own daughters. So I've got a second story and a second archetype where Baba Yaga is still very unambiguously the villain. But in this version, she's actively searching out victims, which is less common than the variants where she lives alone or with her daughters in a hut in the forest and her victims come to her but there's still a few variations on it so this one is called little bear's son and it features a few of the same archetypes from your story of the runt so an old peasant and his wife um, live in the thrice tenth kingdom across the thrice nine lands they have no children and while they're honest and hard working they're poor, and they sell wolf and bear skins to make a small living. One day, upon killing a bear in its den, the old man discovered a three-year-old boy in its lair, which the bear had stolen and was raising as its cub. So the man took the boy home, named him Little Bear's son, and the couple raised him as their own. 
much like the story of Runt, this boy grows bigger and stronger by the hour. And at 15 years old, he's much larger and much stronger than any grown man in the land. He would often injure the other lads while he's playing, until the old man's neighbours told the old man that they must banish him from the village. So, Little Bear's son accepted his fate quite calmly, but he asked his father firstly to buy him a £40 iron club, and then to let him stay for three more weeks in order to train his body. So he exercised with the iron club for three weeks until he could uproot three fir trees and grind them into powder with his bare hands. He then proclaimed that he was so strong that he does not even fear a witch, tempting fate slightly there, before taking up his club, bidding farewell to his parents and leaving the village. On the road, he meets a giant kneeling by a riverbank, catching fish in his moustache. Whenever he caught one, he'd light a fire on his tongue to cook it and then eat it. The giant introduced himself as Moustache Man and asked where he was going. Little Bear's son said that he was going wherever his eyes look and he invited the giant to join him as travelling is better with company and the giant looks strong. The giant said that he was not as strong as Little Bear's son. Upon finding out that it was Little Bear's son who he had met, he agreed to join him on the road. The next day, they met a second giant who introduced himself as Hill Man, who was carrying hills of earth to mend the roads. Again, upon learning that the lad was Little Bear's son, he agrees to join him on the road. Two days later, they meet a third giant, Oak Man, who is driving oak trees into the ground in order to make all trees in the forest the same height. Again, learning that it was Little Bear's son, he chose to join him. After travelling for a further three days, they came to a wilderness filled with all kinds of game, and chose to build a house and live there together. After building their home, they set up a rota so that three of them would hunt each day, and one would stay home to guard the house and cook. On the first day, Mustache Man stayed home, cooked them a fine meal, but the others washed up and began to comb his hair. While he sat there combing his hair, thunder rumbles outside, the earth shook, and the light took on a green sort of quality. Outside, a huge stone lifted from under the earth, and Baba Yaga rode out from this hole in the earth underneath the stone. She knocked on the door, and despite being scared, Mustache Man opened it and let her in. Baba Yaga demanded food, and Mustache Man showed her good hospitality, and he served her roast duck. She ate it all, and then she demanded more, and when this wasn't enough, she flew, flew into a rage, and she beat him almost to death with her pestle. She then cut a strip of skin from his back, ate all the food from the oven, and flew away on her mortar. When the others returned home, Mustache Man was too embarrassed to tell the truth, so he claimed that the smoke from the oven had made him dizzy and he'd fallen and hit his head. Over the next two days, the same thing happened to Hill Man and to Oak Man, and they both gave equally weak excuses. On the fourth day, it was Little Bear's son's turn to stay home, and Baba Yaga knocked, he refused to give her food. When she attacked, he grabbed her by the hair, and with his iron club, he beat her half dead, and then locked her in the cupboard. When his brothers came home, and together they all ate a fine meal, and afterwards, Little Bear's son made them all show him the scars on their backs. They kept trying to make their excuses, until Little Bear's son opened up the cupboard and showed them the captured Baba Yaga. However, upon opening the door, Baba Yaga made her escape and fled back under the rock. The four of them gave chase, and when Little Bear's son lifted the rock, they found a great dark hole beneath. Little Bear's son told his brothers that the witch was now their mortal enemy, and if they do not pursue her into the abyss and kill her, she will torment them all their lives. The giants, however, were too scared to give chase, and so Little Bear's son went alone. He had his brothers tie animal hides into a long rope, stuck a post in the ground, and climbed down on the rope, warning the giants to haul him up if he pulled on the rope. At the bottom of the abyss he found a path leading into the underworld. This world had, had a sun and moon, tall trees, wide rivers and green meadows like the overworld, but no humans or animals except for flocks of great birds flying. After four days travelling, he found Baba Yaga's hut standing on chicken legs, turning round and round, and round endlessly. In the garden of the hut, a beautiful maiden was picking flowers, and she warned him, if he stays here, 
Baba Yaga would eat him, and that she is a hundred times more powerful in the underworld, surrounded by her enchantments. She was currently asleep, but she would soon wake up and ride away. So she told Little Bear's son to hide in the forest until the witch is gone, and then she would show him a way to overcome her, if he promised to take her back to the upper world. When Baba Yaga was gone, the maiden took him into the cellar and showed him two casks of water. She told him to drink all that he could from the right-hand cask. After drinking twice, he claimed he was strong enough to lift and carry the whole hut one-handed. The maiden explained that the cask contained the strong water and the weak water. Baba Yaga gets her strength from the strong water, whereas the weak water makes anyone who drinks it powerless. So she told him to switch the casks round, and then when Baba Yaga returns, to seize the pestle and hold on before she puts it down. Then, because he's taken the strong water, she will be unable to shake him off. After she flies down to try and drink more of the strong water herself, and instead drinks the weak water because of the switched casks, he used to draw his sword and strike her once to kill her. Her mortar, her pestle and her broom would urge him to strike again, but if he did so, it would restore her to life. So, Little Bear's son did as the maiden told him. He switched the casks round, and they returned to the garden. When they heard Baba Yaga returning, he hid. So, Baba Yaga demanded to know why she could smell human, but the maiden said that no one else was here. Yeah, it's a smell of Russian, smell of Russian in some of the versions that I've, uh, that I've read. Yeah. I think in most versions it's the smell of Russians. Yeah, I think this is the only one where it's not specified Russians. Oh, okay. But then Little, little Bear's son was specified as being from the Thrice Tenth Kingdom. Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's an older translation as well, it may have been, for Western audiences, it may have substituted out the word Russian as well. Yeah. So, Baba Yaga said that she was asking about the smell of human because she admitted that the only human she was scared of was Little Bear's son, who she knew was angry with her. But he was so far away that she didn't think he would be a threat. At which point, Little Bear's son jumps out and seizes the pestle. And try as she might, she couldn't shake him off. She dragged him over the whole underworld in her mortar. Um, he just carries on holding on to the pestle. Upon dragging him back to the hut, she flies to the cellar to try and drink the strong water, but drinks from the wrong cask and immediately becomes weak. So Little Bear's son, as he's been told, draws the sword, beheads her with a single blow. When urged to strike again, he responds that a brave man's sword only strikes once, which is again quite a common phrase whenever this method of killing Baba Yaga has to be employed. The hero always, has, always specifies that a brave man's sword or a hero's sword only strikes once. So afterwards, he burns Baba Yaga's body and he and the maiden set off to return to the upper world. On the way back, he finds a nest of fledgling birds and he gives them his cloak in order to protect them from the rain. Upon reaching the hole, he ties the rope to the maiden and has his brothers hoist her up. Upon seeing her, they're envious that their brother gets to marry her, and so while hoisting him up, they instead cut the rope and let him fall back into the underworld. However, the mother of those fledgling birds sees what happens and offers to help him return to the upper world. And while it took three months, he made it back to the house while his brothers were still arguing over who gets to marry the maiden. When they saw him, the maiden embraced him, proclaimed her love for him, and the brothers all fled, and he married the maiden, and they lived together happily ever after in the house. So this one brings in a few traits that do hint somewhat at Baba Yaga's origins. For example, the idea of her living rather than just in the forest, specifying that she lives in the underworld, like there's a few Q analyses that I've read which suggest that this may be related to a role of an older version of Baba Yaga in sort of guarding the boundary between life and death. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, in, in the version that, um, one of the versions I mentioned before, obviously she was listed as like a Slavic um, like god, goddess of the undead or the underworld. So that uh, fits with that older version. Yeah. And similarly to that, the idea of her having the strong water and the weak water. There's other names for these waters, but one of them is the waters of life and death. And the idea of Baba Yaga as a guardian of that. Yeah. 
I read um I read a version of this myself, but it's a bit different. So yeah, it does have, as you say, the waters of life and death instead in mine. And actually the version I read, it's not like look Little Bear's son and um Giants as his companions. It's just uh, bog like Bogadier knights uh, throughout the whole thing. And the mustache knight is, is like it's the same thing, except he's using his mustache as a bridge across the river. Yeah, and there's another similar version. It's an example of the the Prince Ivan archetype, where Prince Ivan and his brothers have to rescue their mother, who was kidnapped by Baba Yaga, and only Prince Ivan is able to find her. And again, their mother tells Prince Ivan that he has to drink the strong water, switch the two waters, and then trick Baba Yaga into drinking the weak water. And again, as the same thing of strike once to kill her, a second strike would restore her to life. Which, again, the idea of a second strike bringing her back might be related to the idea that she's connected with the boundary between life and death, and the idea of one not existing without the other, and that the, the same act that kills her brings her back. I did read something quite similar. That, um, one interpretation was that Baba Yaga is a figure in pre-recorded times, may well have also been um, a figure associated with ritual initiation, and that her kind of a hut, like... Um, may have been considered like a liminal space as a result between uh, like uh, life and death um which which kind of fits with that i mean things like um the uh the kind of animal elements of the hut as well were kind of more uh, thought to be associated with that as well so the third archetype i want to talk about is the idea of baba yaga as a helper character as the hero so usually in these stories, the hero tends to be tends to go by the name of Prince Ivan. Yeah, for anyone um, not too familiar with Russian, the, um, someone being named Ivan is like the equivalent of someone being named John in our in English. It's not as obvious when you look at the uh, like the the derivative words, but they're both uh, deriving. Is it is it Johan or something like like that? Johannes. Johan or Johannes. Yeah. Johannes. Uh, and then, like similarly, the Germanic Hans, which shows up a lot of their folklore, is also derived from the same source. So it's it's John's all the way down, basically. Yeah, and I think the main reason for this in stories is sort of while the hero is a prince, by giving him a, such a common name, it's to make him feel relatable to the more yeah. peasant readers or peasant listeners, as it would have been. It's like saying us over here being like, yeah, uh, Prince uh, Barry. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the name we'd use. <laughs> yeah, definitely Barry. <laughs> so, going to the story, Prince Ivan and his two brothers and their father, the king, lived together in the palace. And as the king was getting older and his sons were grown, the king decided that it was time that each of them got married. He told each of them to take an arrow and shoot it in the direction that they chose. The woman who returns the arrow to them was to be their wife. The first son shoots his arrow to the east. The second son shoots his arrow to the west. Or the third son, Ivan, shoots his arrow directly in front of him, not specifying an actual compass point for some reason for that one. The eldest son finds his arrow with the daughter of a nobleman. The second son finds his arrow with the daughter of a rich merchant. Ivan searched for two days until in the middle of the swamp he found a large frog with an arrow in its mouth. Ivan turns to leave, but the frog tells him to stop and to take his arrow. If he doesn't take the arrow and take her as his wife, he will never leave the swamp. While he's surprised to hear the frog talk, he did make a promise, and he takes this frog home. His brothers mock him for bringing home a frog, and he wonders how he can marry her when she can't be his equal or join him in his daily activities, but the king insists that he marry the frog as he promised. So... He marries her as agreed, and he treats his wife kindly, and they apparently live a quite pleasant life together, all things considered. The king then sets the three wives three tasks. Firstly, he commands that they each make him a shirt. So the elder brother's wives laugh at the frog and claim, you know, she couldn't possibly make a shirt. When Ivan goes home upset and tells his wife what happened, she says, worry not and have no fear. Go to bed and rest. There is more wisdom in the morning than the evening, which is another quite common Russian proverb that shows up in quite a few of these stories, I've found. 
kind of like saying, uh, yeah, maybe sleep on that one, mate. Yeah. And in these stories, it's almost always said by a, a magical helper of some sort before doing something magic that will solve the hero's problems. Mm-hmm. Spoilers. <laughs> so Ivan goes to bed and the frog orders the servants to cut some linen into small pieces. She then dismisses the servants, hops to the window, throws all the pieces of linen outside and commands, Winds, fly with these linen shreds and make a shirt for the king. In a moment, a fine shirt flies back into the room. When the brothers present their wife's shirt to the king, the king dismisses the first shirt as only being fit for a peasant, the second as only being fit to go to his bath, but the frog's shirt he deems to be perfect and only to be worn on the greatest holidays. Hmm. The brothers suspect that the frog is a witch, and so they plot to find out what she's doing on the next task. The following day, the king commands that the prince's wives bake him bread. Again, the frog tells Ivan to sleep, for morning is wiser than the evening. She then fills a cold oven with flour and water, and commands that bread be baked as a clean white loaf as soft as snow. The other two wives who have sent a servant to spy on the frog, and then copy her when their servant reports back, but they only ruin their ovens, while the frog has a perfect and beautifully made loaf of bread. When the other two wives start again and try to bake bread from scratch, one turns out burned and the other turns out half-baked. So again, the king rejects the first two wives' efforts while praising the frog's bread, which he says he's going to save when they have royal visitors on Easter Sunday. Hmm. Finally, he commands each wife to make him a carpet of silver and gold thread. Once again, the frog commands the winds to make her a carpet, and the other wives attempt to copy this and fail and they must hastily attempt to make a carpet and do quite a poor job of it. So, again, the king rejects their efforts, but he orders the frog's carpet to only be used on his table on the greatest of feast days. So the king then holds a feast and dancing in honour of the princes and their wives. Ivan is again upset, knowing that he'll be embarrassed when he shows up with a frog. Again, she tells him that morning is wiser than the evening, and that in the morning he is to go to the palace, and she will join him an hour later. When he hears rumbling and knocking, he is to tell the king, here comes my little frog in her basket. So in the morning, when Ivan's gone, she commands the winds to provide her with a royal carriage and horses, footmen, outriders and runners. She discards her frog skin and she transforms into a beautiful maiden. And when she appears at the feast as such, everyone is stunned by this. At the dance, while dancing, she uses wine dregs and bones from the roast in order to conjure a lake and to conjure swans. The other two wives try and take dregs of the wine and bits of the roast and copy her, but they instead make a mess and anger the king quite a bit. Before the dancing's over, Ivan sneaks out and returns home to try and find a way to stop her from turning back into a frog. So he finds the frog skin and he burns it. When his wife returns, she says, Alas, Ivan! You could not have patience for even a little while, and now you have lost me forever, unless you can find me beyond the thrice nine lands in the thirtieth kingdom. Just know that I am the fairy Vasilis of the Wise. And she turns into a dove and flies through the window. So Ivan goes off to search for her across the thrice nine lands, and in the thirtieth kingdom he finds an old man who knows of her. He tells Ivan that she is a powerful fairy whose father turned her into a frog three years ago out of anger. The time of that curse was almost up, and she would be with him now if he had not burned the frog skin. So he gives Ivan a ball that will roll towards whatever he desires, and so the ball will lead him to his wife. Yeah, that's another common element, is the ball of thread or whatever that leads to the next place you're supposed to go. Yeah, it's a very convenient way of moving a story along, I found. Yeah, that's that's a common feature when there's a, a story with three Baba Yagas where the First, Baby Baby Yaga will go, oh, follow this ball of string. It will take you to my sister. Yeah. And coincidentally, this ball leads him to the hut of Baba Yaga. And this is the story where it specifies Baba Yaga as the grandmother of witches. He Mm -hmm. finds a hut. And the hut is stood turning round and round on its chicken legs. And so Ivan gives it the command that we talked about earlier. Little hut, little hut. Stand the way your mother placed you, with your back to the wood and your front to me. So, the little hut stands still, and Ivan enters. 
So the oldest Baba Yaga is lying on the stove, again, as we discussed earlier. And she says that she, she can smell the spirit of a Russian and demands, are you here by your own choice or by force? And Ivan specifies, part by my own will and twice as much by force. But shame on you for not offering me food or drink or preparing me a bath. Yeah, another another thing of the hero taking her aback by demanding hospitality. Yeah, and so because of his demand of hospitality, Baba Yaga does as he requests, and then he, he, she agrees to help him upon hearing the tale because she hates Vasilis's father. While the version that I read doesn't specify it, other variants do specify that Vasilis's father is Koshe the Deathless. So she explains that Vasilis stops here to rest once a day. Ivan must grab her and hold on as she transforms into a frog, a lizard, a snake, and finally into an arrow. He must break the arrow into three, and then she will be his forever. But once he takes hold of her, he must not let go, otherwise he may lose her forever. So Ivan hides. When Vasilisa flies in, he creeps up behind her and grabs her. When she first turns into a frog, the form that he knows so well, Ivan laughs with joy. But when she turns into a lizard, by, he's revolted by the feel of lizard skin and lets her go, and she immediately vanishes. Baba Yaga tells him he's a fool for letting go, mm. and says that you may have lost her completely, but go to my sister. Vasilisa stops at her house as well. You may have another chance. And so he follows the ball to Baba Yaga's sister's house. Again, he follows the same protocol of commanding the hut to stand still and requesting hospitality for explaining the situation, and the second Baba Yaga agrees to help him. Again, he grabs Vasilisa when she enters. He manages to hold on while she turns into a lizard, but then panics when she turns into a snake and loses her again. So the Baba Yaga tells him he does not deserve this wife if he's so weak, but if he really does want to find her and to get her back, then to go to the third Baba Yaga sister, who may help him. He finds the third sister and repeats the process again. And the third sister warns him that this is his last chance and that if he fails, he will ne never see her again in this world. So this time, Ivan holds on until Vasilisa turns into an arrow, which he then breaks into three pieces. She turns back into her form of a beautiful maiden and throws herself into his arms. Baba Yaga then gives the couple a white mare which can fly like the wind. And on it, they return to the palace. And the king names Ivan as his heir, and they live happily ever after. So the final story that I want to talk about is, like I mentioned earlier, probably one of the most well-known of the Baba Yaga stories. And it does have a much more ambiguous mm -hmm. view of Baba Yaga, while also hinting at some things which may be related to uh, older origins. So this is the story of Vasilisa the Beautiful, not the same Vasilisa as the fairy Vasilisa the Wise, much like Ivan Vasilisa was a very common yep. um, character name for these stories. Yeah, definitely. In this story, there lived in a certain kingdom a merchant. For 12 years, he was married to his wife, and he had only one daughter, Vasilisa the Beautiful. When the girl was eight years old, her mother passed away. However, on her deathbed, her mother gave her a doll and said to her, Listen, Vasilisa, remember and fulfill my last words. I am dying, and with the parental blessing, I leave you this doll. Always take care of it and do not show it to anyone. And when anything bad happens to you, give the doll something to eat and ask its advice. It will help you in all your troubles. Then the mother kissed her daughter and died. After some time of grieving, and several years had passed, the merchant chose to get married again. And much like in many previous stories, the woman he married was not particularly pleasant to his daughter. She had two daughters of her own, of a similar age to Vasilisa. And so while he thought she was, would be good because she was experienced as a wife and her mother, she was not a good mother to Vasilisa. Her and her daughters were both very envious of Vasilis's beauty. And so they abused her, tormented her with all kinds of hard work 
that they wouldn't do it themselves. Gave her less food. Kept her out outside working working in harsh conditions. Basically, so that she had no life of her own at all. However, Vasilisa endured everything and tried to do her tasks as best she could. However, sometimes she was given too much work for one person to complete in a day. When such a thing happened, she would feed her doll some food and ask the doll how she would cope. And the doll, much like other magical helpers, would say, Fear not, morning is wiser than the evening. Sleep and all will be well. And so whenever she did that, the doll would help with her tasks or would find something such as herbs that would help with sunburn if she was out working the fields all day or herbs that would help with tiredness, things like that, and basically find ways to make her life slightly easier. Several years passed and Vasilisa was old enough to marry, as were the other daughters, and all the men in the city were interested in Vasilisa no one would even look at the stepmother's daughters. And so the stepmother got angry and angry at this and one day decided that she would get rid of Vasilisa. One night in late autumn, getting towards winter, as she gives evening work to all three girls, she leaves only one fire in the whole house, just a single candle for them to work by. During the night, that candle burns up and she's instructed her daughters not to relight the candle. The next day, the girls ask, what should we do now? And the stepmother says that there's no fire in the whole house. Vasilisa will have to go to Baba Yaga to fetch fire. Vasilisa, obviously being a good and helpful girl, agrees. Um, but she t goes to her doll and she feeds her doll and says they're sending me to Baba Yaga's house for fire and that Baba Yaga will eat me. The doll tells her not to be afraid, to go where she's sent, but to keep the doll always with her, and nothing will happen at Baba Yaga's house while she's with her. Vasilisa sets off. On the road that morning, a white horseman rides past, dressed all in white, a white horse underneath him, white harness, everything. As she carries on later in the day, a horseman dressed all in red, riding a red horse, red harness, etc., Gallops past as the sun rises further. Vasilisa carries on all night and all day, and in the next evening, she comes to the glade where Baba Yaga's hut is stood. The fence around the hut is made of human bones. Human skulls with eyes are stuck on the fence, and instead of doors at the gate, there are human feet, instead of bolts, hands, and instead of a lock, a mouth with sharp teeth. And Vasilisa is naturally stunned with horror. As she stands there, looking at the gate, a third rider rides past, dressed all in black, riding a black horse, and the sky darkens. As the sky darkens, all of the eyes on all of the skulls on the fence light up and light the area as if it was day. Vasilisa shakes with fear, but knowing that she has a task to complete, she doesn't run. As she's about to enter, a terrible noise comes through the forest, and Baba Yaga is riding by. Again, she says that she smells Russian flesh and demands to know who she is. So Vasilisa explains the situation that her stepmother sent her for fire. So replies that if she lives and works for her, she'll give Vasilisa fire to take back to her family. And if not, she'll eat her. Baba Yaga then magically unlocks the gates with a command and they enter the house. Baba Yaga sets a variety of tasks for Vasilisa to do, all of them very tough tasks and expecting Vasilis to fail. And while, while Baba Yaga sleeps, Vasilis again consults her doll. And for all these tasks, the doll helps her. And this continues for a few days. During the days where Vasilis is working for Baba Yaga, out of the window she again sees the white, the red and the black horsemen. When she sees them, she asks Baba Yaga who they are. The white horseman, Baba Yaga says, this is my bright day. The red horseman, Baba Yaga says, this is my red sun. And the black horseman, Baba Yaga says, this is my dark night, and all my servants are faithful. That part doesn't really have much bearing on the actual events of the story, but that is just another interesting way that older versions of Baba Yaga might have filtered into the more folktale stories 
in that the morning, the sun, and the night are Baba Yaga's servants. It's a, it's a bit of a strange one without context in the story. It's only when you look more into it that you see that this idea is potentially relating to her role as part of a part of the pantheon of gods. A few days later, Baba Yaga asks how she's completed all these tasks. Vasilisa says that she completed the tasks because she is blessed by her mother, and the blessing helps her. And Baba Yaga says, Get thou from me, blessed daughter. I do not need the blessed. So she drags Vasilisa out of the room and out of the gate. She removes one of the skulls with the burning eyes from the fence and gives it to her and says, Here is the fire for your stepmother. Take it. And she sends her home. By the light of the skull, Vasilisa starts to run home. But when morning arrives, the light goes out, as it did at the house. As she approaches the gates of her own home, she wants to throw away the skull. She thinks it's been several days. They probably no longer need fire. But suddenly a voice comes from the skull. And the voice says, do not leave me. Take me to your stepmother. So she looks at the house. She doesn't see any spark of light in the window. Mm. She doesn't see any sign that they've relit the fire. and so. She goes in, and for the first time in her life, her stepmother and her stepsisters greet her affectionately, and they say that since she left, they had no fire in the house. They couldn't light any fire, and any fire brought from the neighbours went out as soon as it entered the room. And so they hope that she's brought back fire, and it will hold on. So she brings the skull into the room and places it to face her stepmother and her stepsisters to show them the fire that should be in it. And the stepmother and the step <clears throat> the stepmother and her stepsisters all burst into flames, <laughs> and they all burn up to ashes. Well, that was abrupt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I know of a lot of the stories where the you know obviously the evil stepmother and stepsisters get punished. It's very much in that kind of Cinderella uh, mold. Um, but I, I must admit, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, that's it. This version. It literally says the bit where I said they greeted her affectionately and said that when she left, no fire, they had no fire in the house. Then it's, perhaps your fire will hold on, said the stepmother. They brought the skull into the room and the eyes of the skull staring at the stepmother and her daughters and they burned. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, once again, Baba Yaga in the guise of uh, being bountiful to those in need, but being a agent of revenge against the selfish. Exactly, yeah. So. Although with that blessing stuff you mentioned, of course, that's where it then goes back to being ambiguous where she wants to get rid of her as soon as she realizes she had, she had a blessing on her. Like with um, the version we were saying before about the frog princess, even when Baba Yaga is being helpful, there is often a hint at some other motive. Like in this case, the idea of just wanting to be rid of the person yeah. who has a blessing upon her or previously helping not out of kindness, but helping because she hates Koshe. Yeah, I mean, there's a few versions of things I read as well where she's like, she's tricked by the hero into giving something up or helping him rather than that. So it's it's also kind of her in the unwilling helper role that she's also portrayed in sometimes. Yeah. So this version of the story that I have does have another old woman come in in just a moment who helps the girl, but there's no real suggestion of magical powers. The girl, because her father's away, away on business, now just moves to the city, and she asks a kind old woman if she can rent a room from her. And the kind old woman agrees and, and asks Vasilis to help her with tasks such as weaving and sewing. And by helping this old woman, she then creates a lot of clothes and similar items that the old woman can then sell to the king. Yeah. And when the old woman shows them to the king, the king is stunned by how well crafted they are and basically offers the old woman any price for them and offers her a job at the palace and everything. And the old woman says, these weren't made by me. These were made by my helper, Vasilisa. And so he summons Vasilisa and seeing her beauty, falls in love with her and asks her to marry him. And so when her father comes back, she brings her father to the palace, and they all live happily ever after in the palace. Hmm. So yeah, 
there is that helper old woman figure while there's never really any hint of her being more than just an old woman there are still some of the more kindly aspects of Baba Yaga brought in there whereby by helping the old woman the old woman then gets her riches by getting her married off to the king yeah there's a few variants of the story I've read where either an old woman as we say is mentioned who is not described explicitly as a Baba Yaga I think I even mentioned to you there was one story I came across that the name of which escapes me at the moment was uh, where it's actually an old man who has many of Baba Yaga's characteristics, which is kind of strange. Yeah. And again, seeing Vasilisa in that role is again in the kind of, you know, the role of, of the, the perfect Russian woman, so to speak. She's beautiful. She could do all these household tasks. She can make wonderful clothing, etc. Is that continuing theme going on? Yeah. Like many of them, the theme of her, she's kind of she... You know, does as she's asked without complaint if she helps people. That being rewarded is another common trait with many of these stories and many of these young female heroes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, Crofty, uh, if I am right, now that we've gone through a good chunk of these various different tales, you are then going to round off by talking about some maybe international parallels to Baba Yaga in other countries outside of, kind of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Yes, yes. So there's three variants that I'm going to go into, all quite briefly, because two of them definitely have enough material for their own episode, whereas the third one probably does, if I could speak Finnish. <laughs> That's a very small portion of the world population. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although I will say there is a um, website, the Gutenberg Project, which has one of the pages on it is translating a lot of old Finnish yeah. fairy tales. And so if you're an interest in that, I would highly recommend looking at it because there's some really, really good stuff on there and they're doing, they're doing some good work. So yeah, the three that I'm going to go into, I'll briefly talk about the German, the German equivalent, who would probably be the most well-known to the Western world on account of the fact that she does appear in Grimm's fairy tales. Yeah. And this equivalent, again, has the quality of helping the kind girl while harming the unkind girl. So it's very similar to the story that we talked about at the start, wherein you have a widow, her daughter, and her stepdaughter. And so the biological daughter is a selfish and spoiled child, while the stepdaughter is a kind and helpful one. Hmm. The kind and helpful daughter one day accidentally pricked her finger on the point of a spindle. And as she leaned into a well to wash the blood away, it fell into the well and sank out of sight. And fearing punishment, she climbed into the well after it. And she found herself at the bottom of the well in a meadow, where she found in this meadow a loaf with an, um, an oven with a loaf of bread in it. The bread asked to be taken out before it was burned, and she did. She then came to an apple tree, that requested that its apples be harvested. Again, she helped. Finally, she came to the house of an old woman, and the old woman offered to allow the girl to stay if she would help with housework. The old woman identified herself as Frau Hull, and she cautioned the girl to shake the feather bed pillows and the covers well and make the bed every night. And when doing that, it would snow in the girl's world. She asked the girl to work for her for a while, and she agreed, and she always took care of the bed and always made sure of, of cleaning the bedroom and cleaning the house. After a while, the girl becomes homesick and she told Frau Hall that it was time for her to return home. Frau Hall was impressed with the girl's kindness and so when she escorted the girl back to the well and showed her how to get back up, a shower of gold fell upon her. Frau Hall also returned the spindle that she'd originally lost when she fell into the well. And when she went, went back through, she returned back to the well real world, not far from her mother's house. The mother wished the same fortune on her own daughter, and so she told her to sit by the well and spin. The girl deliberately threw the spindle into the well before following it and climbing down, but this girl wouldn't help the bread get out of the oven and left the bread to burn. She left the apples to go overripe on the tree, and when she started to work for Frau Hall, she became very lazy and did a very poor job and Frau Hall dismissed her. When the girl got back to the gate that led to the well, 
instead of just being allowed back, back to her own world, a kettle of pitch spilled over her, and Frau Hall said, this is what you have earned, and closed the gate. That's very similar to one of the Baba Yaga stories, except unfortunately the the the, the second uh, woman ends up being eaten by Baba Yaga. Yeah, and I think the change in method is mainly just a cultural thing. But I, either way, the the whole moral of if you're kind and helpful, you'll be rewarded. If you're selfish and lazy, you'll be punished. Is still there, and the fi- figure of Frau Hall herself, like I said, does resemble Baba Yaga. Yeah. You have to be careful as well is that the uh, Grimm's fairy tales, they actually, as far as I'm aware, they rewrote their initial editions of it to make it less violent within their lifetime. So it depends on the version as well. It may have been sanitized somewhat. Yeah, what I'm reading here, that it was published in 1812 and some some things were changed in the 1819 edition. Yeah, but that, it's not, that's basically. Yeah, not specified which parts were which edition. The next one um, is a Japanese Japanese figure, a yokai, or a spirit, called Yama Uba, who, again, shares much of the darker aspects of Baba Yaga, but again has a similar story wherein a kind sister is rewarded, and then when a selfish sister tries to get the same reward, is punished. And she has similar descriptions to Baba Yaga, um, with the main difference being that she lives in the mountains, which is identified by having the name Yama as part of her name, which is the word for mountain. Yeah. And there are also entire classification of yokai, which are called babas. Yeah. And which have a lot of different characteristics, but are all old women. And like I say, would merit an episode on their own. Yeah. I think um, I think a lot of people may be familiar with uh, kind of the baba as a figure from, um, I think, Spirited Away, maybe a good example of that for a Japanese version. Yeah, Yubaba. So that, that one, I think Hayao Miyazaki himself did say that he took quite a bit of inspiration from Yama Uba and from the Baba yeah. yokai. Yep. And then the final one is from the Finnish culture and is called Suyata. And that pronunciation is, again, from this um, Gutenberg project where they specified that they were spelling it as phonetically as they could and spelled it as Suyata. Mm-hmm. The original spelling is like S Y O umlaut J A umlaut oh, yeah. T A umlaut R. Complicated. Yeah, I was never <laughs> going to get that one right. <laughs> Similar to Baba Yaga, um, she's described as an emaciated old woman. Only in this this version, she's always depicted with a heavy pregnancy belly, while the rest of her is practically skeletal, mm. and. Well, I've not found any like actual original images of her. All the images that people do that I think are on like DeviantArt and WordPress and such like, they're stuff of nightmares. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, looking through the collection which I read as well, they like got permission to reproduce a whole bunch of that stuff, and there is a the some people went very creative. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting to look at, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. And th- this version is explicitly evil, but shares a lot of Baba Yaga's qualities. She has the iron teeth. She's known as the mother or grandmother of witches and ogres, but also as the mother of disease. And this version is much more active in seeking out prey rather than staying in a house. She still preys on orphan children, young women and such, but she's almost always active in how she does it. And she also tends to act as the trickster in some ways. Mm. Like one variant where in order to marry a prince herself, she convinced a woman who was going to marry a prince that her brother was telling her to jump in the river and kill herself. And after after she claimed it three times, the the girl finally said, well, if my brother is telling me to do that, I must do it. And she jumped in, which is uh, pretty horrific. Yeah. Pretty bad. She does survive um, in this version. The Sea King binds her to stay in his world and lets her go back three times. And in that, the prince asks for the help of a kind old woman in the forest, who is also thought to be a variant of Baba Yaga. And they go through the same process from the Frog Princess of 
of her transforming into various forms while he has to hold on to her. So there's a lot of similarities there that suggest either they shared yeah. shared a common origin story or transfer between cultures. Yeah, it seems to be drawing from the same common body of myths, at least. So, Okay, Crofty, I think that's probably about everything we have time for today. Yes, I was about to say that's all I have left. Yeah, and it, it says something that, you know, imagine when we cut this down, it'll be like two, two and a quarter, two and a half hours, maybe. We barely scratched the surface of Baba Yaga today. I think that's safe to say. Yeah, hopefully we've give, at least given listeners a good starting point. So I'll just add my references since you added yours at the start. One book that was very helpful, well, it didn't have much on Baba Yaga herself. It gave some good context, is um, Slavic Folklore, a Handbook by Natalie Kononenko. I also had a chapter from a book on Baba Yaga, Baba Yaga, the Witch from Slavic Fairy Tales by M. Oleskiewicz Peralba. Apologies about the pronunciation. And then, like I said before, Old Peter's Russian Tales, compiled by Arthur Ransom. The Baba Yaga, Wicked Witch of the East, that we discussed earlier. And Baba Yaga Tales by Jennifer Wigginton. So that should be a very good starting point for any listeners who are keen to learn more. Yeah, and one of the other things I just want to say is, um, obviously, a lot of these stories are very old and have been published since you know, the tw- early twentieth century in the West. In many cases, so there are also a lot of probably public domain versions of these works out there in English. If you go over to archive.org, which is where I read that original story years back and where I got most of the poetry quotes for, you can always head over there and you'll probably be able to find them as well. I understand right now we are in the middle of a bit of an economic kerfuffle, we should say. Hmm. So if people want to get the free version, that's probably the best way to have a look. Yeah, a lot of the folklore books are available on Kindle um, for like a pound or so as well. So yeah. if you can't get the free version, there are cheap versions. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, Crofty, so before we go... I just wanted to say to everybody, thank you for listening to the show this far. If you uh, wanted to know more about what's happening with the show, you can always follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash the underscore histocrat. The YouTube version of the show does come out um, relatively soon after the audio version, and you can find that over on the histocrat channel, which from the looks of things, either today or tomorrow, is going to hit 100,000 subscribers. Yeah, so that'd be a nice, nice little celebration of the channel is getting this up in time for that. So apart from that, uh, this uh, channel is also supported by a small Patreon, uh, of which all proceeds are currently going back into financing uh, improvements to the channel. So that you can find at patreon.com slash the histocrat. And uh, we've been kind of, I think I've been banding around the idea in my head, Crofty, maybe, have, maybe we should have a separate kind of Patreon for this one day, but... Uh, We'll wait and see for the moment and uh, give this show a bit of a chance to to breathe, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, still early days yet. If you are over on YouTube and you want to find the audio version of this, you can find it over on Libsyn, it's on Apple Podcasts, and it should also be on Spotify and Stitcher. So just search for Mythological and you should be able to find it pretty quickly. Okay, anything else you want to add, Crofty? Uh, No, I think that's it from me, so... And thank you everyone for listening. Yeah, thank you everybody. I'll see you guys from my Siberian exile for the next one. Okay, take care. Bye.